My name is Martin Vieca, VP of Investor Relations, and I'm joined today by Elon Musk, Faye Baftanecha, and a number of other executives. During this call, we will discuss our business outlook and make forward-looking statements. These comments are based on our predictions and expectations as of today. Actual events and results could differ materially due to a number of risks and uncertainties, including those mentioned in our most recent filings with the SEC. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Kilowatt, a podcast about electric vehicles, renewable energy, autonomous driving, and much, much more. My name is Bodie, and I am your host. And on today's episode, we are going to talk about Tesla's Q1 2024 financial results. Uh, well, actually, we're just going to talk about the earnings call. We're not going to hit too much into the financial realm of things, because that's not what this podcast is about. This podcast is about figuring out what Tesla's uh, where they're succeeding, where they're failing, and what their plans are, or we try to lead the, read the tea leaves as to what their plans are for the next quarter and the next year. This is going to be a long one, to be honest with you. So let's go ahead and jump into Elon's opening remarks. In Q1, we navigated several unforeseen challenges, as well as the ramp for the updated Model 3 in Fremont. Um, we, there was, as, as people have seen, the EV adoption rate globally is under pressure and and a lot of uh, other water manufacturers are pulling back on EVs and pursuing plug-in hybrids instead. We believe this is not the right strategy and electric vehicles will ultimately dominate the market. Uh, Despite these challenges, the Tesla team did a great job executing executing in a tough environment uh, and uh, energy storage deployments, the mega pack in particular, reached an all-time high in Q1, leading to record profitability for the energy business. And that, that looks likely to continue to increase uh, in the quarters and years ahead. It will increase. We actually know that it will. Um, so uh, significantly faster than the, the car business, uh, as we expected. Uh, we also continue to expand our uh, AI training capacity in Q1, more than doubling our training compute uh, sequentially. In terms of the new product roadmap, there's been a lot of talk about our upcoming vehicle line in the next in the past several weeks uh, we've updated our future vehicle lineup to accelerate the launch of new models ahead of previously mentioned startup production in the second half of of 2025 so we expect it to be more like the early 2025 if not late this year these new vehicles including more affordable models will use aspects of the next generation platform as well as aspects of our current platforms and will be able to be produced on the same manufacturing lines as our current vehicle lineup this, so it's not contingent on any new factory or massive new production line. Uh, it, it'll be made on our current production lines much more efficiently. Um, <clears throat> and, and we think this should allow us to get to uh, over 3 million vehicles of, of capacity uh, when realized to the full extent. Uh, regarding FSD version 12, um, which is the, the pure AI-based uh, self-driving people that if, if you haven't experienced this, I strongly urge you to try it out. It's profound. Um, and the rate of improvement is, is rapid. So we've, and we've, we've now turned that on for, um, all cars with the, uh, cameras and inference computer and everything from hardware three on, uh, in North America. So it's been pushed out to I think around 1.8 million vehicles. Um, and we're seeing about half of people use it so far, and that that percentage is increasing with each passing week. Um, so we now have over 300 billion miles that have been driven with FSD V12. Um, since the launch of full self-driving, super, supervised full self-driving, it's become very clear that the vision-based approach with end-to-end neural networks is the right solution for scalable autonomy. And it's, it's really how humans drive. Uh, the, the, our entire road network is designed for biological neural nets and eyes. So naturally, uh, cameras and digital neural nets are the solution to our current road system. 
Um, to make it more accessible, we've reduced the subscription price to $99 a month, so it's easy to try out. And uh, as we've announced, we'll be showcasing our purpose-built um, robot taxi or cyber cab in August. Um, yeah. Regarding it, regarding AI compute, um, over the past few months, we've been actively working on expanding Tesla's core AI infrastructure. Uh, for a while there, we were training constrained in our progress. Uh, we are at this point uh, no longer training constrained, and so we're making rapid progress. Uh, we've installed and and commissioned, meaning they're actually working, uh, 35,000 H100. Uh, computers or GPUs. GPU is the wrong word. They need a new word. <laughs> I always feel like a wince when I say GPU because it's not GPU. Stands, G stands for graphics and doesn't do graphics. Um, but anyway, roughly, uh, roughly 35,000 H100s are active and we expect that to be probably 85,000 or thereabouts by the end of this year in training, just for training. Um, we are making sure that we're being as efficient as possible in our training. It's not just about the number of H100s, but how efficiently they're used. Um, so in conclusion, we're super excited about our autonomy roadmap. I think it should be obvious to anyone who's driving uh, version 12 in a test that, uh, that um, it is only a matter of time before we exceed the reliability of humans, and it, not much time at that. And. Uh, and we're really headed for an electric vehicle, uh, an autonomous future. And I wanted to thank the Tesla team for incredible execution during this period and look forward to everything that we have planned ahead. I think it's important to remind everybody that I do edit these clips on Elon's opening remarks. I cut a little bit off from the beginning, but this is pretty much his entire opening remarks. I didn't edit much out of this. Um, so let's talk about it a little bit. He talked about unforeseen circumstances, which is why they had a, a down quarter. Well, and, and some of that might be true, but they produced a whole lot more vehicles than they delivered. So I don't know if that's exactly what's going on with the unforeseen circumstances. Like that might have had a little play, but I don't think it had as much as they are uh, saying. Let's put it that way. Uh, he talked about other companies going, uh, moving a little bit away from electric vehicles and more into hybrids, and that's a mistake. I agree with him. Uh, the energy business hit record profitability. That's fantastic. They are, Tesla is accelerating new models. Uh, so the new models are not going to be a whole new platform. They're going to be a mix of this generation and next. So I think that's smart, honestly, because I don't think Tesla has quite the capacity right now to be doing something that's revolutionary every single time they come up with a, a new model. So it's good that they'll be able to run on the same production lines. That's great. Uh, let's get some affordable vehicles out there and then we can update them over time. And then that brings us to FSD. So they really hit AI a lot in this earnings call. So I'm not going to say too much about FSD and their AI efforts. I am going to kind of I am going to correct, I don't know if it's correct is the right word. I'm going to counter Elon a little bit. And he said that vision-based approach for FSD, which is how humans see the world and how our road systems are set up, is the right solution. And I would say, yeah, it's the right solution for Tesla. I'm not sure it's what Tesla is doing is the right solution for every auto manufacturer out there. There may be a better way to do it or a different way to do it that's equally as good. So... Um, when he says those kind of things, I just kind of want to throw that out there. He mentioned that it's only a matter of time before FSD exceeds the safety of a human, safety driver. It's only a matter of time before FSD is safer than a human. And only a matter of time, sure. He implies that that's going to be sooner rather than later. I've been hearing him say this since 2016, so I am skeptical. All right, let's go ahead and get to our first retail investor question. What is the status of 4680? Uh, what is the current output, Lars? Sure, um, 4680 production increased about uh, 18, 20% over from Q4, reaching greater than 1K a week for Cybertruck, which is about seven gigawatt hours per year as we posted on X. We expect to stay ahead of the Cybertruck ramp with the cell production um, throughout Q2, as we ramp the third of four lines in phase one. 
um, while maintaining multiple weeks of sell inventory to make sure we're ahead of the ramp. Um, because we're ramping, COGS continues to drop rapidly week over week, driven by yield improvements throughout the lines and production volume increases. So um, our goal, and we expect to do this, is to beat supplier costs of nickel-based sales by the end of the year. All right. I don't have much to say on that, to be honest with you. And we will get into more 4680 cell battery questions later. So let's move on to our second retail investor question. Uh, so what is the current status of Optimus? Are they currently performing any factory tasks? When do you expect to start mass production? Uh, we are able to do simple factory tasks, or at least I should say factory tasks in the lab. Uh, the in terms of actually, we do we do think we will have Optimus um, in limited production in the factory, in the actual factory itself, doing useful tasks before the end of this year. Um, so, uh, and then I think we, we may be able to sell it externally by the end of next year. Uh, these are just, just guesses. Um, as I've said before, I think Optimus will be more valuable than everything else combined. Uh, because if you've, if you've got a, a sentient humanoid robot uh, that is able to navigate reality and do tasks at, at request, um, there is no meaningful limit to the size of the economy. So that's that's what's going to happen. Um, and I think Tesla is best position of any humanoid robot maker to be able to reach volume production um, with efficient inference on the robot itself. The, I mean, this perhaps is a point that is worth emphasizing. Tesla's inference, AI inference efficiency is vastly better than anyone, any other company. No, there's no company even close to the inference efficiency of Tesla. We've, we've had to do that because we were constrained by the inference hardware in the car. We'd never choice. Um, but that, that will pay dividends in many ways. I've said before, I'm really looking forward to having a humanoid type robot in my house to do all of the things that I don't want to do, which are many, to be honest with you. Uh, I think it's cool that Optimus is helping out at the factory, or at least in the lab sense, helping out at the factory. Uh, have some factory robots by the end of the year on the line doing something. Maybe it's moving one box from one place to another. I, don't, I honestly don't know. But I think the end of 2025 might be a little bit soon for Tesla to start selling this to other uh, businesses. There's just too many things for a robot to do that I don't think Tesla, I don't think not so much Tesla. I don't think the Optimus robot is going to be good at those things by the time they're ready to sell it. But what I do see happening, and I think this is more likely, is they do something like they did with the Tesla Semi, where they go to a partner like Pepsi and they said, hey, we're going to sell you these. You cool with that? And then Pepsi's like, okay, we'll take 10. And then those 10 are being tested in whatever capacity Tesla uh, Pepsi needs them to be tested. And they can technically say they sold some, but in reality, they're still in testing. I, I think that's much more likely. All right, let's go ahead and move into our next question. What is Tesla's current uh, assessment of the pathway towards regulatory approval for unsupervised FSD in the U.S.? And how should we think about the appropriate safety threshold compared to human drivers? Uh, sure, I can start. Um, there are a handful of states that already have adopted autonomous vehicle laws. Um, these states are paving the way for operations, while the, we, the data for such operations guides a broader adoption of driverless vehicles. I think Ashok can talk a little bit about our safety methodology, but we expect that these states and the work ongoing, as well as the data that we're providing, will uh, pave the way for a broad-based regulatory approval um, in, 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 in the U.S. at least, and then other countries as well. Yeah. Um, it's actually been pretty helpful that other autonomous car companies um, have been cutting a path through the regulatory jungle. Um, but the, which is, so that's that's actually quite helpful. Um, and they, they have obviously been operating in San Francisco for a while. I think they got approval for city of LA. Um, so these, these approvals are happening rapidly. I, I think if you've got at scale 
it's a statistically significant amount of data that shows conclusively that the autonomous car has, let's say, uh, half the accident rate of a human-driven car, I think that's difficult to ignore because at that point, stopping autonomy means killing people. So I actually do not think that there will be significant regulatory barriers provided there is conclusive data that the autonomous car is safer than a human-driven car. Now, now, something I should clarify is that Tesla will be operating the fleet. Um, so you can think of like how Tesla, um, think of Tesla like I don't know, some combination of Airbnb and Uber, meaning that um, you know there'll be some number of cars that Tesla owns itself and operates in the fleet. There'll be some number of cars, and then there'll be a bunch of cars where they're owned by the um, end user, but that end user can add or subtract their car to the fleet whenever they want. And they can decide if they want to only let the car be used by friends and family or only by five-star users or by anyone. Um, and at any, at any time, I, I think there's also some potential here for an AWS element um, down the road where if we've got very powerful inference, um, you know, because we've, we've got a hardware three in the cars, not, not, but now all cars are being made with hardware four. Hardware five is pretty much designed and should be in cars, uh, hopefully towards the end of next year. Um, and there's, there's a potential to have for the to, to run when the car is not moving to to actually run distributed inference. Um, so kind of like AWS, but with distributed inference. Like it takes a lot of computers to train um, an AI model, but many orders of magnitude less compute to run it. So if, if you can imagine the future paths where there's a fleet of 100 million Teslas, and on average, they've got like maybe a kilowatt of inference compute. That's 100 gigawatts of inference compute distributed all around the world. It's pretty hard to put together 100 gigawatts of AI compute. And even in an autonomous uh, future where the, the car is perhaps used, instead of being used 10 hours a week, is used 50 hours a week, that still leaves over 100 hours a week where the car inference computer could be doing something else. And it seems like it would be a waste not to use it. All right, let's jump into this. It's definitely to Tesla's advantage that other autonomous car companies have uh, gone through that, as Elon calls it, that regulatory red tape. That's definitely a big benefit for them. As it stands today, full self-driving still falls under level two autonomy. According to the Society of Automotive Engineers, this is how they break down level two autonomy. You are driving. They put that in bold. Whenever these driver support features are engaged, even if your feet are off the pedals and you're not steering. So technically you're in control of that vehicle. You must constantly supervise these features. You must steer, brake, and accelerate as needed to maintain safety. So that's for level zero, one, and two of autonomy. Then they break down, and as far as level two autonomy goes, what these features do. And it says, these features provide steering and brake acceleration support to the driver. Example features are lane centering and adaptive cruise control at the same time. So we're still under level two for full self-driving. If we were gonna move to level three, this is what you're looking at, for level three, four, and five, you are not driving when these autonom automated driving features are engaged, even if you're seated in the driver's seat. So for level three specifically, when the feature requests you to take over, you need to take over. There's a little bit of crossover for level three and four because the features in level three and four uh, can drive the vehicle under limited conditions and will not operate unless all of the required conditions are met. When you get to level four, there is some features for local driverless taxis, but they, again, all of the conditions that are preset, and I don't know exactly what those conditions will be, but it would probably be, probably be uh, the weather needs to be optimal. 
it's only operating on these roads, that kind of thing. But in order for RoboTaxi to really work, we need level five autonomy, which is, you know, really similar to level four, but it will work in all conditions and locations. So while I freely admit I have not experienced FSD version 12, from what I'm hearing from family members who have Teslas and from people who listen to the show have Tesla who have Teslas, um, and just reading different articles about it of people who don't own stock in Tesla and don't have a financial interest in hyping up the technology because there are a lot of people out there who uh, have, you know, X accounts or uh, YouTube pages where they clearly own stock in Tesla and they do not have a reason to be um, unbiased. Let's put it that way. But anyway, I, I, it's neither here nor there. Um, uh, it, it is a bugaboo of mine. But there are people that I trust who are saying very positive things about full self-driving, but it's not perfect. And when I ask, is this something that you would feel comfortable riding in the car and not paying attention? The answer is no. I don't think I've had anybody say yes. So we're not quite to level five yet. Maybe we will be soon. I genuinely don't know, but I've been down this road with Elon so many times in terms of it's right around the corner, it's right around the corner, it's right around the corner. It's never around the corner. One day it will be right around the corner, but I don't think that day is anytime soon. So now that we got that out of the way, um, Elon said that the autonomous car will be someday safer than a human, and I do believe that. As to when that will be, I have no idea. I think it's further out than Elon thinks. And then finally, let's bring it back to the regulators who are saying, yay or nay, you can drive on our roads in level four or five autonomy. Even if Tesla gets that approval, there are still citizens that are going to be in the areas where Tesla gets approval who may not be happy about this. I will be 100% honest, the, the people in my neighborhood, when Waymo vans started driving around, when I say my neighborhood, I mean like the larger neighborhood, the communities around that Waymo vans are driving in, people were not happy about it. Now take that uh, um, healthy skepticism of something new and then add to that uh, a, a CEO of a specific company that may or may not say crazy things randomly on Twitter and may or may not say things just to make other people mad because he gets a, uh, or they, excuse me, get a chuckle out of it. Um, and then add to that, that maybe that CEO ordered people in his company to fake a video. And so it looked like the technology of their car could do something that it couldn't do. Imagine if all those things were the case, and then that company wanted to, let's say, test their cars in a certain community, there might be a little bit of an uproar in, in, in that regard. Um, and I still, like, now I'm even, I have even more doubt that we'll get full autonomy with Hardware 3 than I did in the past. Elon said Hardware 5 cars will be coming at the end of next year, which is... Uh, soon compared to how long it took hardware three and hardware four to be put out. Um, hardware three was out for a good long time before they put out hardware four. And then that'd be about a, a year and a half between hardware four and hardware five. All right. That's enough of me. I have more thoughts on other things, but I'm going to go ahead and cut it off here because I'm getting too long winded. Let's move on to our next question. Can we make FSD transfer per permanent until FSD is fully delivered with level five autonomy? No. So after Elon answered no, there was giggles in the room. And I think this is extremely inappropriate. I think it's uh, poor taste because again, and I, I hate to continue beating this uh, dead horse here, but the promise of hardware two of having full self-driving level five autonomy did not happen the promise of full self-driving with level or hardware three autonomy uh is probably not going to happen and there are people who have for a variety of different reasons have had to buy new cars 
whether that's because their cars just aged out or they wanted a new car or it got in an accident or whatever. There are people who have paid for full self-driving and never got to use it. And in some instances, they've paid for full self-driving because they believe in the mission that Elon has, has put out there. They've paid for it several times and they still have not received full self-driving. I am not a litigious person, but I could definitely see a class action lawsuit in the not too distant future um, for Tesla. And I, I really believe that they're gonna end up losing. And the bad news about the class action lawsuit is all of the people involved will probably get uh, pennies and the lawyers will get the lion's share of the, uh, the settlement, which sucks. All right, let's go ahead and jump into our analyst questions. Let's go to Adam Jonas from Morgan Stanley. Assuming that you nail execution on your next gen, cheaper vehicles, you know, more aggressive giga castings, I don't want to say one piece, but getting closer to one piece, structural pack, unbox, 300 mile range, $25,000 price point, putting aside robo taxi, those features unique to you, how long would it take your best Chinese competitors to copy a cheaper and better vehicle that you could offer a couple of years from now. How long would it take your best Chinese competitors to copy that? Thanks. I mean, I don't know uh, what our competitors could do, except uh, we've, we've done relatively better than they have. With, you know, if you look at the drop in our competitors in China's sales versus our drop in sales, our drop was less than theirs. So we're doing, a, we're doing well. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I think, you know, Kathy would said it best, like, really, we should be thought of as an AI or robotics company. If, if you value Tesla as, as just like a, an auto company, you just have to fundamentally, it's, it's just the wrong framework. And it will come to be, if you, if you ask the wrong question, then the right answer is impossible. Um, so, I mean, if, if somebody doesn't believe Tesla is going to solve autonomy, I, I, I think they should not be an investor in the company. Like that, that is, but we will, and we are. Um, and then you, you, you have a car that goes from 10 hours of use a week, like an hour and a half a day, to probably 50. But it costs the same. I think that's the key thing to remember, right? Especially if you look at FSD supervised, if you didn't believe in autonomy, this should this should give you a preview that this is coming. It's actually getting better day by day. Yeah, if if you if you've not tried the FSD 4.3, and like I said, 12.4 is going to be significantly better, and 12.5 even better than that and we have visibility into those things, then you really don't understand what's going on. It's not possible. Yeah, and, and that's why we can't just look at just as a car company because a car company would just have a car, but here we have more than a car company because the cars can be autonomous. And like I said, it's happening. Yeah, <clears throat> this is all in addition to Tesla's work. In the overall AI community is just like increasing, like improving rapidly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're putting the actual auto in automobile. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, you know, so sort of, of we like, well, sort of like, tell us about future horse carriages you're making. I'm like, well, actually, it doesn't need a horse. That's the whole point. Um, and that's that's really the whole point. So I left that clip mostly unedited because I wanted you to get a sense of where Elon was at. I don't think he answered that question, by the way. Um, you know, he says, I don't, I don't really pay attention to the Chinese market. He's mentioned in the past that Chinese automakers are doing incredible things. So he does pay attention to it and he's competing, uh, competing against them. So the likelihood of him paying attention to the Chinese auto market is quite high. At the very least, he gets reports about what, how his competitors are doing and what they're up to and what cars they're, they're offering to answer the question that Elon did not answer. I don't think it's a matter of Chinese automakers copying Tesla because there are already Chinese automakers like BYD that are putting out very nice, affordable EVs. It's a matter of these automakers being able to put out an EV 
that closely compares to what Tesla's offering at $25,000 at a cheaper price. So if Tesla's offering their car at $25,000 and the Chinese automaker is able to build almost as good of a car for $20,000, but it includes many of the same features as full self-driving, for instance, for a lot of people, $5,000 is a big difference. And if you can get many of the same features without having to pay extra as full self-driving, and you get similar features that you would get in the in the Tesla $25,000 version, that it's really hard to choose a Tesla when you want to buy a new car, you want to buy an EV, but you can't afford $25,000 for a new car, but you can't afford twenty. dollars and you can't afford $25,000 for a new car and an additional $100 payment on top of that, so which would be for the full self-driving. So I, I think that uh, Tesla will build us a, a very nice $25,000 affordable car, and I think that that is needed for sure. But the Chinese automakers are already, they're already building cheaper cars. Um, and then Elon makes mention that if you don't understand that Tesla is an AI robotics company, then you've missed the point. Well, right now you're a car company and you're kind of an energy company on top of that. And maybe one day you'll turn into an AI robotics company, but you're not there yet. You right now you sell cars and some of what those cars have some AI in it and that's it. Like it's not, let's looking 10 years in the future, maybe you are an AI and robotics company and you just started by building cars, but right now you're a car company. Let's go ahead and move on to our next question, which is about the round of layoffs that Tesla just had. Um, I'd be interested also in potentially more qualitative discussion of what the implications are for these headcount reductions. What are the types of activities that you're presumably sacrificing um, as a result of parting ways with with these folks. Thanks very much. So, you know, uh, like we said, we've done these headcount reductions across the board. And, you know, as companies grow over time, you you know, there are certain redundancies, there's some duplication of efforts which happens in certain areas. So you need to go back and look at where 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 all these pockets are, get rid of it. So we're basically going through that exercise wherein we're like, hey, how do we how do we set this company right for the next phase of growth? And the way to think about it is, you know, any tree which grows, it needs pruning. This is the pruning exercise which we went through. And at the end of it, we'll be much stronger and much more resilient to deal with the future because the future is really bright. Like I said in my opening remarks, we just have to get through this period and get there. Yeah, we're, we're not um, giving up anything uh, that it's significant that I'm aware of. So um, we've, we're just, we've had a long, long period of prosperity from 2019 to now. And, um, you know, so if a company sort of organizationally is 5% wrong per year, you know, that accumulates to 25, 30% um, of, of inefficiency. We've made some corrections along the way, but but it is it is time to reorganize the company for the next phase of growth. All right, I think that was a good explanation. Um, I did cut out the part where Elon was talking about cells in your body and how your body grows and how that's like a company. I cut all that stuff out. Uh, so if you want to go back and listen to that, you can. I'm not sure why you would want to, though. Let's go ahead and move on to our next question. Let's go to Mark Delaney from Goldman Sachs. Uh, Mark, please go ahead and unmute. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Thanks very much for taking the question. Uh, the company had previously characterized potential FSD licensing discussions as in the early phase, and some OEMs had not really been believing in it. Uh, can you elaborate on how much the licensing business opportunity you mentioned today has progressed? And is there anything Tesla needs to achieve with the technology in terms of product milestones in order to be successful at reaching a licensing agreement in your view? Well, I think we just need to, it just needs to be obvious that our approach is the right approach. And I think it is I think we're now with 12.3. Um, if you just have the car drive you around, it is obvious that our solution 
with a relatively low cost inference computer and standard cameras uh, can uh, achieve self-driving. Uh, no LIDARs, no radars, no ultrasonics, nothing. Just no, no heavy integration work for vehicle manufacturers. Yeah, it's uh, so it would really just be a case of um, you know uh, uh, having them use the same cameras and inference computer and licensing out software. And um, but but it's 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 once it becomes obvious that if you don't have this in a car, nobody wants your car. Yeah, it, it's like it's a smart car. It, and, you know, I, I mean, I still remember like back when Nokia was. Uh, King of the Hill, yeah, cell phone yeah, crushing, and um, and I, and and I saw them come out with a smartphone that was basically a brick um, with limited functionality, um, and then uh, you know the iPhone and Android, but people still did not understand that all the phones are going to be that way. There's not going to be any flip phones. Like there'll be a niche product or home phones. Yeah, not even exactly. When was the last time you saw? A home phone. No Is it like an I have no idea. Yeah. In a hotel. Sometimes in a hotel. Yeah, the hotels have them. Yeah. Um, so, if people don't understand, all cars will need to be smart cars, or, they, or, or you will not sell this, the car will not, nobody will buy it. Um, once that becomes obvious, I think licensing becomes not uh, optional. Becomes a method of survival. Yeah. It's, it's, license it or nobody will buy your car all right this is something that frustrates me sometimes when elon's talking license it or nobody will buy your car let me tell you why that's not true first um i think the tesla interface on my car like the uh infotainment system is fantastic i love it uh it is way better than the crappy mazda rx9 that i used to have and i loved my mazda but the interface uh, it didn't have an infotainment system, first of all, it just had a radio and a CD player. But the interface on that was very blah. And with the Tesla, it changes and things get better. And that it's awesome. It's way better than my Mazda. Okay. So I'm, I'm telling you that. So I can tell you this. In our fire department, we uh, have had a rash of new people. And what tends to happen after somebody graduates the fire academy is they go out and buy a new vehicle. And I'm looking at the cars in the parking lot of the station that I work in. Those cars are, they have very minimal interfaces if they have any electronic interface at all, right? Tesla's is clearly better. Anytime somebody sits in my car like, oh, this is so cool. But their car's interface in terms of like the radio and stuff like that, awful, Absolutely awful. It's the most basic interface you can get, but they're still buying those cars. I actually have on, on another shift, one of the firefighters, she has a Mercedes. I don't know which one it is, but it's very nice. She likes the Tesla interface better than her car's interface. Now her car is gorgeous and she takes really good care of it. But um, in terms of, you know, the, the, what she can do with her car that I can do with mine, completely different different. Like I, I have way more options than she has. Now, if you move that analogy to full self-driving versus just driving on your own, right? Most people don't have uh, driver assist type features like they have an autopilot or, or full self-driving. They may have some of those features, but they don't have, they don't have it set up quite like Tesla does. Uh, Ford does a really good job and some other companies, GM Cruise does a good job. But, you know, just normal people, they're just driving their cars. They're not turning on anything special. So now you have to convince that person that this new technology is going to be amazing, but you're going to have to spend a whole lot more money for it, or or you have to have a subscription price, or you can buy this car over here that drives just as nice, but doesn't cost as much. Um, you know, I, I don't think people are going to make that leap and spend the extra money. Some will, I think most won't. And I, I don't think they'll care that they didn't get the feature, to be honest. I think they're going to be okay with driving their own car versus a car that maybe drives itself. And then Elon makes the analogy of the smartphone, right? Nokia at its height had the brick phone and then iPhone came along and then Android came along. 
Well, in his own example, Apple's not licensing their technology out to other manufacturers. Android has made itself available to anybody who wants to use it. So we now we have two options in the cell phone market. So using his own example against them, uh, there, there's going to be many different options. And I think Apple will be one of these options one day, but there's going to be many different options in the full self-driving or autonomous driving space for automakers to choose from. And in most cases, I do think that the automakers are going to roll their own autonomous driving suite. Um, maybe event, maybe initially they license it from a company like Tesla, but I really, I really feel confident that those those automakers don't want to be beholden to Tesla. That I'm sure they don't mind partnering for a period of time with Tesla or other automakers. But in the long run, I don't think they want to be beholden to their competitors. All right, let's go ahead and resume the answer from the Tesla team, and they're going to talk about how you know uh, legacy automakers are implementing this new technology or could implement this new technology? I mean, one other thing which I'll add is, in the conversations which we've had with some of these OEMs, I just want to also point out that they take a lot of time in their product life cycle. Yeah. They're talking about years before they will, you know, put it in their product. They might, we might have a licensing deal earlier than that, but it takes a while. So yeah. this is where the big difference between us and them is. But yeah, I mean, really, a deal signed now would result in it being in a car in probably three years. Mm -hmm. Something that would like be that. early. <laughs> yeah, that's like lightning, yeah. basically. So that's being an eager OEM. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we do sign a deal. I think we good chance we do sign a deal this year. Um, maybe more than one. Um, but yeah, it would be probably three years before it's integrated with a car, even though all you need is cameras and our inference computer. So it's like not a massive design change. Yeah, and again, just to clarify, it's not that work which we have to do, it's the work which they have to do, which yeah. takes the time. I would imagine that it's more complicated than they are, are stating in, in this situation. I don't have anything else to add on this, and I'm going to go ahead and end the show here because listening back to the clips, they just kind of circle back on some of the things that we've already covered, and I don't know that there's a huge benefit in listening to those. But I would encourage everyone, if they want to, to go and, and listen to the entire earnings call. This one was a very low-energy Elon, and when we get a low-energy Elon, it's a, it's a weird earnings call. Uh, I don't know how to explain it. This one just felt very weird and stilted, but he started to engage more towards the end. And I think you could, you probably noticed that. All right, everybody. I want to thank you for listening to this episode. I want to thank you for listening to the kilowatt podcast. I really appreciate it. Appreciate it. That was a weird way of saying that I, I've been up for a long time today. I'm very tired. So I'm going to go to bed after this. Um, if you want to email me, it's Bodie, B O D I E at 918 digital.com. You can also find me on Twitter at 918 digital and, uh, yeah, that is it. I hope you all have a wonderful weekend and I will talk to you on Tuesday and we're going to go over GM's earnings call. would like to make um, a short announcement. And uh, I wanted to let the investment community know that about a month ago, I met up with Elon and Vibov and announced that I'll be moving on from the world of investor relations. I'll be hanging around for another couple of months or so. So feel free to reach out anytime. But after this seven year sprint, uh, I'm gonna be taking a break and spending some good quality time with my family. And I wanted to say that these seven years have been the greatest privilege of my professional life. I'll never forget the memories from, I started literally at the beginning of production hell and just watching the company from the inside to see what it's become today. 
And I'm especially super thankful to the people in this room and dozens of people outside of this room that I've worked for over the years. I think the, the team strength and team work at Tesla is unlike anything else I've seen in my career. Elon, thank you very much for this opportunity um, that I got back in 2017. Thank you for seeking investor feedback and regularly and debating it with me. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, the, the reason I, I reached out to you was because I thought your analysis of Tesla was the best that I'd seen. Thank you. So, um, yeah, thank you for uh, helping Tesla get to where it is today over seven years. It's been a pleasure working with you. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, thank you for all the thousands of shareholders that we've met over the, the years and walked around factories and uh, loved all the interactions, even with the, even the tough ones. And uh, yeah, looking forward to the call in the next three months, but I'll be on the, the other side uh, listening in. Thank you very much.